Um, I'm going to be talking about porcupine quill work. And I've been doing porcupine quill work almost all my life. Since I was 19, 20 years old is when I first started uh, doing quill work. I think it was 19, no, I was actually 20 when I first ran into my aunt and she said, do you do quilt work? I said, sure. I said, I made lots of quilts. She said, no, I'm talking about quilts. I said, no, I don't know what that is. She said, well, you, you, you should try it. She said, you would be good. So uh, when I did get a chance to learn, it was during the uh, Ottawa Chippewa Arts and Crafts Co-op, which had been started down on Lake Street, pretty much, I think, next door to where Warden Eyes was today. So. Um, there was a, that co-op there where Native Americans made articles at home and then brought them in, sold them to the co-op, and then um, would be profit sharing at the end of the year. So I was a difficult person to get hired or even look for a job because I was severely uh, shy. Uh, and, I, and I had a hard time. I couldn't walk in the store and say I'd like to apply for a job. You know, I'd like to fill out an application. I was uh, raised in a boarding school and, and uh, really uh, in there we were taught mouth shut, feet on the floor, you know, arms folded, you know, and, and to this day I sit with my arms folded, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, and I told my kids, you know, mouth shut, feet on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, very strict there. So we didn't, we're not allowed to talk at meals so we didn't know how to socialize. After a while, we became like fish out of water. You know, it's out in public, we didn't know how to act. You know, we, we were taught things that most kids were, were doing and we were not able to do it because we were all born with restrictions, you know, built into us during our, our Catholic upbringing. So the boarding school was here in Harbor Springs and I went to school there for eight years, from uh, second grade to eighth grade. And, 1957, no, 56, something like that, until 1960. So I failed the fifth grade. I stayed in the fifth grade for two years. But from the boarding school then, I went to uh, high school in Charlevoix, which is where I was, I was born. So being in high school, I uh, went to school, and there was kids in the hallway yelling, laughing, screeching, slamming doors, throwing books, uh, cursing, swearing, making out, pinching butt, and all this other stuff was going on, and I thought, you know, how am I going to learn anything in this place? <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned how much I didn't know about socialization and how to behave in public, and and so those were the f the four most loneliest years of my life. And then one day, when I was in the eleventh grade, I heard. My dad come in the house and they had company, so they were all sitting in the um, in the kitchen and they're and they're drinking coffee. And I heard, you know, my dad talking, and I didn't recognize some of the other voices, but I knew one of my uncles was in there. So uh, I sat down on the steps and I listened, and I heard my dad say, "Of all my kids, I think only Yvonne is going to be the only one to graduate." That freaked me out because <laughs> I was contemplating quitting school because it was it was awful for me. Mm -hmm. So when I heard him say that, then I did go and I finished and I graduated in 1965. So um, after I graduated then, um, I couldn't find a job. I had no life skills. Uh, um, wasn't like things, you know, like uh, today they teach you life skills, how to write checks and how to do things, but they don't, didn't do that back then. You know, we just got out of school and like, what do we do? So my, even my dad never told me I have to go to work and get a job and, and support myself. Mm -hmm. So it was a really rough way to go. So I stayed unemployed until Kennedy and uh, President Johnson, when their program came through, the War and Poverty Program came through, and they hired Native people into certain specific jobs through adult Native women and men who went out into the communities found people, you know, to, with skills or a, and, uh, an aptitude and then would place them into a job. So that's how I ended up working on Lake Street. 
And uh, so I went there working as a sales clerk. And when I answered the phone, they answered it, you know, and my face was like a thermometer. I just turned red, <laughs> straight red on up, you know, and, and, and because I was speaking in public. And I was speaking in front of my coworkers, which I had never done before. So by the end of six months, it was a little easier working with them. And uh, they would tell me, well, it's your turn to take care of the next customer. Because it was a regular little store. We sold Native Arts. So I, we rotated, taking, taking turns. And then when I wasn't working with them, I was typing and, and doing light office work. And then I would go out and watch them work. There was a basket maker in there named Helen Cochran. Uh, there was a the guy doing wood carving and he was general maintenance. He did the shoveling and all the other um, heavy duty stuff. Uh, his nickname was Pawnee, but his last name was Gasco. And then there was a, another student there named Dwayne Pugama, who was uh, soon to be my competitor when um, my teacher Susan said that she would be willing to teach me how to do quill work. And then uh, there was our boss, Victor Kishigo, who was uh, um, who now owns the uh, Indian Hills Art Gallery. So the Ottawa Chippewa Arts and Crafts Co-op went from being a co-op into an art gallery, which he ran all those years. So I learned a lot from them in there. I was artistic, it was natural. My father was a wood carver and a cartoonist, and my mother was an artist and a watercolorist. So I got a lot of gifts from them. Um, my father was also a plumber. My mother became a practical nurse. So, um, so I had a good work ethic that watching them work and, and then, you know, and realizing that, you know, this is how it is, it's going to be. So I did work in an arts and craft shop with them for about six years. By then they had moved out to Kigomi, which means place of the fish. And it's where that bank is right now, right near Tannery Creek. There was a little store there. And then one day Susan Shaggy Navy comes in and she said, today I'm going to teach you a quill work. Oh good, I said, I went to the table and I sat at the table where we are all working and she said, no, 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 no. She said, you know, you're going to learn like I did. You're going to start from scratch. Follow me. And we'll out, we'll out the back door we went, opened up her trunk. There was this great big dad, dead rotten porcupine in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still on the shovel. They used a the shovel to pick it up and it's still laying on it. <laughs> So she picked the whole thing up and she said, I want you to pull off all these quilts. And she set the shovel on the ground in the driveway. And so I got the dish pan and, and uh, so she showed me how to pull it. And, and uh, so I started pulling quilts and I learned that day what upwind and downwind. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked and then I took the, went in the back door and I said, I think I'm done. She came out and she looked at it. She said, no, some more. Went back in. Four more times we did that. No, some more. You know, and, and pretty soon he's starting to look bald, and you know, there's just a couple straggly hairs on him left. And, you know, so I finally went in, and, I, and she looks at it, and she says, Good. She said, So we got some sticks, and, and we dug a hole right next to that porky in the driveway. And then she tipped her shovel over, and it fell off the shovel and into the hole, and we covered it up. She threw the shovel back in the trunk. <laughs> So I learned how to wash those quills, which looked a lot like this, um, only they were all in a dish pan. This is a, these are porcupine hairs from the, the porcupine. This is probably one third of the pelt. It's white and brown, they come in different colors. Um, this is my staff member. <laughs> this porky uh, is, a, is a rodent. He's constantly eating all the time and grazing eats almost everything. I haven't found anything that it doesn't like. It will eat almost everything. It, it'll chew up your porch steps. It'll chew up the, the old outhouses. They used to love to chew up the old outhouses. Shovel handles, the underside of cars, you know. They would chew on all of that. And then, uh, and then just wander away. It didn't, doesn't hibernate. It only holds up in a hollow tree during a storm. So, the porcupine is where these quills come from. A porcupine will eat constantly, grazing all the time. And uh, it, it's not a protected animal. It lives in the woods and it can live an entire lifetime if nobody disturbs it in about one acre of property. Wow. So 
So if he holds up in a, a hollow beech tree for the winter during a blizzard, he doesn't even have to go out to eat because he can just start eating the inside of that tree where he's at. <laughs> and, and he processes that. Mm -hmm. So he's really an, an amazing creature. In the summertime, um, he, uh, the porky um, eats vegetables, flowers, <coughs> fruits. It'll chew bark off of the maple trees in the spring, and it's in the, uh, the fir trees in, in uh, February. So it's in different kinds of trees throughout the year. And in summertime, they just move and graze. So they have uh, 30 to 40,000 some quills, and they come in different colors. There's uh, white, white and brown, white with yellow tips, white with brown tips, white with very, very dark tips on the, on the quill. And then I also have all brown or white and gray or <coughs> white and mostly gray. So there's a lot of variation and I believe that has to do with what they are eating at that time. The only time <coughs> pelt is really good is from September till May. Um, a lot of times we get a call saying, did the porky over on that road? Yeah, porky alert, they call it on Facebook. <laughs> So, there's a the, the porky over there, you know, on Chandler Hill Road or something, you know, and, and uh, but we don't use the summer pelts because their diet is too rich. They eat, they eat veggies, they'll eat the feed in somebody's mulch pile and clean that out for them. Um, then I tell people, if you have a stump in your yard and you want it removed, just pour salt on it and the porkies will come and eat that. Uh -huh. and so, you know, they eat pretty much everything. So they're, they're nocturnal. When you go on a shore drive going up towards Sturgeon Bay, you can see them walking on the side of the road. They think they're invincible to cars, you know, and it, these are like guard hairs on them. So when they're annoyed and alarmed, these guard hairs go up. And underneath the guard hairs are mixed in under fur. And then inside the under fur are these quills, all at different lengths, anywhere from a half inch up to four inches long. So he has a lot of quills. He has the quills from behind the ears all the way back down to the end of his tail and on both sides, both sides. Then some real fine ones from the, kind of like from the shoulder down to the elbow and then down on his side, some real fine ones. And, uh, and I've only seen one albino porcupine in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. They're pretty rare. And when there is one, nobody shoots it or kills it or anything, but everybody wants to go see it and take his picture. <laughs> in the spring, the mama porky has one little baby. <laughs> Sometimes there's two, which is pretty rare. And then this little guy, within an hour after being born, he is fully capable of taking care of himself. Wow. He has, uh, he's born with quills. Um, he can defend himself. And, uh, and all he has to do is chase his mom when it's time to eat and catch up to her and remind her that, hey, I'm here, you know, you gotta feed me. So he stays with her for about six weeks. And after six weeks, then he's almost able to take care of himself. And by then, he's probably the size of a grapefruit. So he's a pretty small little, little creature. So the, the mama just walks along and eats, and this little guy follows and eats whatever she eats. So. Um, he remembers what she's eating. And I remember looking into a porcupine's eyes one time, and on this one here, his eye is very, very beady, very dark eye, you know, and, uh, and all you see is a reflection from the light, and that's actually how they look. You know, that's, that's a, the closest I've seen to what a porcupine eye looks like. And then um, one time I was uh, working, and a guy called me up, and he said, I got two porcupines. He said, you want them? I said, I do. I said, but I'm at work. I said, can you take them to my house and leave them in the front porch? He said, sure, I can do that. So I said, then when I come home after five, I'll pay you for that. He said, all right. So I got home, cooked supper, cleaned up, put away the dishes, uh, went out and checked the porkies. They were laying in the porch, sure enough, just like you said. So I took them into the room and set them on our table. And I was going to start pulling the porky. And uh, we start behind the ears pulling porkies. And we, it's kind of like a wrist action. 
you grab it like a clump and you just twist like this and then pull them out, you know, and they come out real easy. So I started on the one porky and I had this patch pulled out behind his head, across his shoulders, you know, and they were coming out pretty good. And, uh, and I had the TV there on this side and the porky laying on the table and I was listening to Tom Brokaw and I stopped to look, you know, see what was on TV. Out of the corner of my eye, that porcupine blinked. Oh, and I looked at that porky and I said, gee, because he's still alive. <laughs> so apparently when the guy shot the porcupine, um, he must have just paralyzed it, but it was still alive. You know, and, and it couldn't move when I was pulling the quills off, and that really spooked me. Uh, yeah. It scared me. But yeah. he came in with the with the pliers, and I went. He said, "Go in the kitchen." And he said, "Get yourself a drink." So I went in the kitchen and got myself a drink. And then by the time I came back, the porky was dispatched. You know, he he hit him right on the end of the nose. That kills them instantly. And we have gotten porkies from people with all kinds of holes in them. We tell them no body shots. You know, we want them in a head because that kills them instantly. So uh, we get a little fussy about the pelts we get. Um, people bring us roadkill. The tribe, Department of Natural Resources, brings us quilts. Or they'll pick up a porky, throw it in their freezer, and then give us a call, and whoever wants the porky can go and pick it up so it's first come, first serve when it comes to the porcupines, they'll pick them up off the road. So without the porky, we wouldn't have this quill. So every fall, my in-laws have a ghost supper and they serve porcupine meat. And I have never actually eaten porcupine on purpose. I ate it there by accident because they serve wild game. You know, sometimes there's barbecue squirrel or, or barbecue um, raccoon or, or venison steak. So. It's all wild game, duck, you know, fish, you know, it's all there, plus other foods. If you don't want the wild game, then you get, your, you get to eat the other foods. But with our ghost supper, when they serve it and you go there, you're supposed to eat a little bit of everything, not just what you want, because you're eating for your ancestors and their ancestors. And so if you refuse a food, you're insulting that ancestor and their family. So everybody takes a little bit of everything. So I ended up eating a little bit of porcupine, but I felt awful because to me it was cannibalism. Um, I've done a term paper in college on the porcupine. He has about 50 parasites living on his body. So um, he's a, a remarkable little creature. And uh, when I teach a class sometimes, my first class I taught, I told the people, since I had an eight to five job, and they had to work on their quill work while I was gone, so to keep them busy, I said, jump in your car and go out and find a picture of a porcupine. So they had to go out and ride around on the roads and find a, a roadkill, take his picture, <laughs> and then come back. You know, so uh, that was one of the things that we had them do. So, um, well, porcupine, um, there would be no porcupine quills. Mm -hmm. So the porcupine quill work is done from uh, all, over, all over through Michigan, wherever the porcupine lives, there is some form of quill work. So it, it could be from Ohio on up north to the, the, the ice line, you know, for the solar, uh, the, the northern poles, it, all the way up to that, and then across the entire United States to Washington State, and then on down south into California to Arizona, there are small porcupines I look down there in, Port in uh, Arizona. So there are about eight species of porcupines here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then just the other day we were wondering, you know, I wonder if there's porcupines in Europe. So there are, but they are different from ours. And I can't remember what the difference was. Was it? And, and there are porcupines in Africa. Mm -hmm. So the African porcupine is the size of a house cat where ours is probably the same size, but ours has 30, 40,000 quills, and the African uh, porcupine has fewer, but their, their quills are like, like spikes, long ones, and when they walk, they rattle. Mm -hmm. So National Geographic has a special out on a lion cub bothering a uh, porcupine, and that porcupine 
held his ground and defended himself against the two lion cubs. <coughs> you know, they had clothes on their feet and, and, you know, and they wandered off you know, until they got rid of them. Uh -huh. So I brought this along. It's an African porcupine cool box that um, it's got a slide lid on it. It's got little white dots on it. The little white dots, this is an old porcupine quill box. I'll pass it around. It's old because there's a moratorium on the taking of ivory. So the little white dots on this box are ivory pegs. So this was made before that moratorium came on. And I believe this was probably made around the 1970s. So that's the last time I saw a, a porcupine an African porcupine quill box um, was in Detroit in the store window. And then Better, Better Homes and Garden had, was advertising this chair and laying on a table there was two African porcupine quill boxes. I couldn't believe it. I ripped that page off and made copies of it <laughs> and showed it to people. Can we go into Detroit and inner cities you know, and talk to kids and tell them that your culture also has cool work, you know, and, you know, but since there's a moratorium now on the killing of porcupines in Africa because of the civil wars, uh, it's such an easy animal to kill that uh, quills are almost extinct, so um, they cannot take the quills. So there used to be a place in New York used to sell African porcupine quills by the hundreds. You could buy them by the hundreds, but that no longer occurs because the African porky is endangered. So I, mean, I brought that along as something just to, to show. The other item we use on our, on our quill boxes is sweet grass. It's got a lot of names. They call it holy grass, <coughs> Seneca grass, plain old sweet grass, uh, wigwas and wigabish is what we call it, you know, for, for sweet grass. And it's, we picked ours in Sheboygan County. This is Sheboygan County grass, which is really a nice length for, because a few years ago it was very, very short and it was a bad year for sweetgrass. And it's got a very fragrant smell. Since this is a year old, the, the smell is still in it, but it, it's fading. And, uh, and to revive the smell on there, we, we, can, we can get it wet and the water and the warmth you know, will help bring that smell of the sweet grass back again. So that was used as a cologne. It was used as an incense for native people. You know, they would chop it up real small, soak it in water, and grab it and squeeze it on top of their head. And that cologne and sweet grass oils would drip onto their hair and they, they smelled real fragrant. So that was a cologne. It was also burned as an incense for ceremonies. It's given as a gift to elders or as a form of respect. And there is no story about how we got sweetgrass because it is one of our medicines. So uh, we have four medicines. We have sweetgrass, cedar, um, tobacco, and sage. So there are no stories made up about how we got those four things other than that's a gift from the creator. So when we pick that, we go out there and we sit on buckets and we cut it off like one blade at a time. We cut off the sweet grass, and then we put them in little bundles, and then we take them home and we string all these bundles, rubber bands, you know, bundles, so it looks like a big grass skirt. And then we push them all together, and we soak them in hot water, hot tub water, tap water, and that washes uh, dust, bugs, and enzymes. It kills enzymes that could make the sweet grass mold. You know, so we wash it really good, and we keep it in the hot water for about 10 minutes and then flip it over, add more hot water. Then after, after that, you know, we're ready to hang them up. So we hang them up, attached to the wall in the house <coughs> and it's just allowed to hang out of the sun to dry. So um, then it's ready to go. We roll it up in a tablecloth and then put it away out of the light and whenever we need it, then we just unroll it and take some out. So that's how we treat our sweet grass. I used to pick it pretty fast, you know, and I was really proud of myself one time when I was out to Burt Lake, and I remember this old lady uh, who did pool work. So I went to her house and I said, I picked some sweet grass, do you want some? She said, yeah, she said, I'll come out. So she came out to the car and they were laying in the trunk with a big bundle about like this, you know, and so I took it out and laid it on the trunk lid, and she said, I'll take half. And I just about fell over, you know, because 
you know, what she was taking, she was taking half of everything that I had picked. <laughs> so, because I had picked, uh, I had picked uh, mint too, same time for mint tea grows in the same field. So she took half of that too. And I was just, I was pretty shook up because I put all that work into it, you know, and she takes half of it. You know. So the following year when I went back there again, I took half and showed her half, you know, so I got some tea grass, and she did it again. She took half. <laughs> But it didn't take me long to learn either. You know, those those polar bears, you know, when you get too old to go in the woods, you know, they'll take whatever they can get, you know, so that they can stay employed. Because it takes a year to get our materials. Um, if you don't get all your materials out in one year, then uh, then you end up being unemployed, or you end up having to buy or trade for your birch bark. So this is a piece of bark from a white birch tree. The look at it is brown, this is the sap side. And when you look at it on this side, this is the side of the tree that had the white. So what we did was we peel it off. And then we washed the sap side with hot water and we used uh, a scratch pad, like uh, Scotch guard pads, we use those to wash it. And what that does is it removes the sap that's on there because if we keep the sap on, the bark will get darker and darker and darker as the years go on. So the older the bark is, then the darker it'll get. So we take, uh, we try to keep good care of our bark. And for the longest time, I used to, and it, well, I'll go through the back. Native used to store under their beds, you know, you know and, and keep a weight on it to keep it flat. Mm -hmm. And then I learned, Susan said she keeps hers, you know, under her bed. And then other people, you know, kept under their bed. When I worked for her, she to go to the store, she had a cooler. And I noticed that in that cooler, it was always 60 degrees. It was a walk-in locker, a meat locker. So it was always about 60 in there. And when we walked in, the bark was still flat and it looked good, you know, it wasn't fading or anything. So it occurred to me that we're, we should keep this, you know, where it's nice and cold. So I used to rent storage units, and that's where I kept it. Because if it gets hot, like outside today, if I put this out in a car, this thing would curl up so tight, like a, like a paper towel roll. It would roll right up, and once it curls up like that, you can't hardly do anything with it. But except maybe stuff it and use it for uh, fire brands because it would contain all the stuff you need like for a torch. So that's what all it was good for. So it occurred to me not too long ago, maybe less than 10 years ago, that I should be storing this in a freezer. So I bought a freezer and now I store it in the freezer. <laughs> my son, he picks the bark for me since the doctor told me to stay out of the woods. Indians are age, he says, don't belong in the woods. <laughs> well, I went back out in the woods this year and I had a great time. <laughs> so, I now store the bark in a freezer. And it, and, it, and it works really great because when we take it out, it's frozen. It comes room temperature, we can wash it, and then it's almost as fresh as when we cut it off the tree. So, those three raw materials are basically what goes into a porcupine quill box. And I brought along a four inch quill box. It is a cutaway view of the construction of a quill box and what goes into it. So this can get passed around and then uh, you, you can check, check it out and see you know, what's involved with, with uh, the making of a quill box. This is natural color, that white is natural color from the porcupine. And the shading we get is only determined from the shading that we do on the, on the quill box. So if we don't do, uh, uh, we want just all white like that one is, um, then that's okay, it won't fade. But if we use shaded material, shaded quills, um, sometimes they'll fade. I made a nice buffalo one time and sold it to his family and it was really nice. Then they, they brought it in one day and they said something's wrong with our quill box. I said, why, what's wrong with it? Because I didn't see any broken quills on there or anything, so uh, they said, well, it's, the color's gone. Sure enough. I said, where'd you keep it? They said, we kept it in our front window where everybody could see it. <laughs> well, the sun bleached and took the color out of that, the porcupine, so that's like they were looking at a, 
a white pill box with an albino buckle on it. You know, <laughs> it was gone. So I told them, you know, that you have to keep them. You have to take care of the pill boxes because they are made of a natural product and you need to keep them where they don't fade, where they don't work because temperature change like today and then 60 degrees in the winter time, it'll make it change and warp. So um, there's a lot of care that needs to be done with, uh, with the, the pull boxes. So Native Americans, our original pull boxes were something like this. There's a lot of bark showing. There's just a little decoration around the side. Whatever was inside, since we didn't have a written language, there was a picture on top of the box to show what was inside the box. So it might be like dried fish, or it might be dried meats, or it might be seeds, herbs, medicines. That picture would be on top of the box. And the boxes, once they were made, they were used for that one same thing all the time. And the mark of a good box is when you take it apart, it's a little bit snug. Because you don't want bugs crawling crawling up and crawling under the lid and getting into your food that you have stored. And when I know there are things that you can't see, microorganisms that you can't see, you know, all around the world, all over. And, uh, and I learned at Indian Hills at one time, before it became Indian Hills, he sent me into the back and he said it's inventory time. So I had to go to inventory and count everything. And I saw this box and it said, um, corner squash seed necklaces. So I got the box down and I opened it up and it was just a mess. All the corn, something got in there, ate all the corn, it was gone. <laughs> the seeds were nibbled on, the thread was nibbled on, and they all fell apart and I showed them the damage and it was because of the microorganisms that's around. You know, they might have been in the cardboard box or the food in the box or they might have been um, on the seeds, whoever made those necklaces didn't wash them good enough or something, you know. So all these microorganisms were on it already. So that happens with museum pieces. The old ones, museum pieces, they get them and then they weren't stored properly. Or the families that are donating them have them exposed and dust gets on them and they're in the dust there's microbes and they eat because it's a natural product. So a lot of times the mice, poor mice got the blame for eating up all the pill boxes in the museums. <laughs> but, uh, but now we know that it's microorganisms. So when I wash these pelts, you know, when I mentioned earlier that, that we wash them, I wash them in whisk, which is a great oil cutter. And then I rinse it three or four times. And then in the fourth rinse, I put in a handful of borax, which is a natural insecticide. And then that coats all the quills when we lay them out to dry so that when a bug comes along and lands in there, it doesn't taste good and, it, and he dies, you know, if he tries to eat it. So now we have, we're um, recommending people who do have quill boxes to cut a round circle of archival paper, soak it in a wash of dissolved borax, hang it up to dry, and when it's dry, then you can set your pull box on top of that borax sheet and then the little critters that come crawling around looking for something to eat will mm -hmm. run into that paper before it gets to the pull box. Mm -hmm. So that helps protect it. We used to um, make little borax pillows uh, and uh, put the soap in the little pillow and then set it on the pull box on top. That still works too, but the paper is much, much easier and more convenient so for, for viewing the pull box because you can make each paper the shape of the pill box to protect it. So um, Monday and Tuesday, this this box here is being made by a nine year old how old is he? The boy? Um, Hunter, how old is he? Eleven. He's eleven, okay. He's learning how to do pill work. <clears throat> so Monday and Tuesday when we have the class the class is going to learn how to make a three inch pull box, something like this. So this is his, his uh, second piece. So, he, And it's a little rough, but it's his first one. So it's amazing is they did the sewing themselves and they find it hard to believe that I didn't sew that for them because it's a lot like my kind of sewing. The only thing I helped them with was how to do the knot, the half hitch you know, to hide the knot. So they did all the rest themselves. And, and, and I think they're doing a great job for their age. You know, and they stayed at it because 
People say it's tedious. I think it's therapeutic. I don't think it's tedious. I enjoy doing quill work. Um, I get disturbed when people want to take me away from quill work. You know, <laughs> you know, like holidays, Christmas, Easter, and, and I got to put two away, and you got to cook these big feasts and dinners, and, and I can't wait for company to go so I can get back to work. <laughs> so I don't consider it work either. You know, it's, it's, uh, my son called it quill art, which is probably what we should call it, yeah. quill art. My teacher, Susan Shaganavy, was a full blood Odawa. She lived here in Harbor Springs and made hundreds and hundreds of quill boxes. And her and her husband, Charlie Shaganavy, they designed and developed this kind of a box. This one is also made by a student. It's called the Spiderweb. It's an ugly name for a pretty box. Oh, but um, this is made by another one of my students. and. Uh, but its original design was done by Susan, my teacher, Susan and Charlie. So we considered having students bake that in two days, but I don't think it would uh, quite work so good. Because the first one I made took a week. So, so the simpler one, the three inch one that's going around, is more like uh, how, you know, it's an introduction on how they're doing quill work. When Europeans came here, they found uh, items like this, you know, sweetgrass. And Vic Kijigo told me that the original purpose for the sweetgrass was when they sewed it together and made it into a cone, a cone-shaped thing, it was used to filter water because it was sewn so tight that the water, the, the water would hit the cone and sit in there and then slowly start to dribble on down or drip into the pot that was underneath. So the original sweetgrass things that was used for uh, purifying your water. And then after the water got into the pot below, then you could throw your food stuffs in it, your dried meats, your seeds, your herbs, or whatever you were gonna cook, you know, dried squash or beans, whatever you wanted went into that pot and it was cooked. But um, this is a repair piece, and after I repaired it, the people uh, said I could have it. <laughs> so, so we keep it and we use it for our our um, programs like this one. So that's a sweetgrass basket. Very, very popular. There are very, very few people who do sweetgrass ones. I think there's some down in Wapool. There are sweetgrass workers in Manitoulin Island, but locally. Um, probably, I think there's one in, in St. Ignace that does sweetgrass work, but very few people are doing the sweetgrass work. Whereas when I was learning how to do pro work, uh, Susan used to tell people it's a dying art. Someday nobody's going to be doing this, you know. And I, I would hear her say that, and I'd think, you know, as long as I'm alive, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to teach and tell people about it. And uh, she would tell me that as long as she's alive, she's the teacher. When she dies or when she's gone, that I become the teacher. So I said, okay. She said, by then, she said, you'll know. People will come and ask you to explain it. You know, talk about it and tell them what it is. So I said, okay. She said, because by then, you're going to be the one that knows. So I said, okay. So I got in a car accident in August, uh, broke my kneecaps and didn't make it back in 1973 to Alpena Community College, go back to school. So I ended up living in Traverse City and uh, recuperating down there. And uh, while I was down there, then there was a knock on the door and this old man, this younger woman was standing at the door and they said, we hear you teach quill work. Oh. And I said, no, I had never taught anybody. And they said, would you be willing to teach us? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'll give it a try. And so they said, how much you charge? I don't know. I said, well, what do you got? They said, we got food stamps. <laughs> All right, I'll charge you $30. I said, food stamps. And what I did with the food stamps was it fed them during the week while they were there staying with me. They had their sleeping bags, everything. I said, crash upstairs, you know, and so they did. And they took the class. Well, Friday when we got done, and I took them to market with me from Traverse City, we came up to Petoskey to, to um, it, I think we are still, it, by then it was Indian Hills Art Gallery by then. And when I walked in, you know, and, and introduced them uh, to Victor, and then Victor said, how come you come to Susie's funeral? I said, funeral? He said, yeah, he said, she died on Monday. 
And I turned and looked at the two people because it's the same time they came and knocked on my door and asked me, will you teach us how to do forward? <coughs> so I have been teaching ever since. And uh, working with Susan and them in the store helped me get rid of the shyness, gave me more confidence, made me feel good because I was learning something that very few people know how to do or know anything about. And I wanted to do boxes that were so in detail that it would be difficult to duplicate. You know, people do attempt to copy, but um, I tell them, if you want to do that design, just ask, and I'll say yes. I don't ever tell anybody, no, you can't do that design here. Because um, I, I, I share what I know. So all they have to do is ask, and that's just out of respect. Because if I saw something I liked, like my teacher Susan gave me patterns and designs, especially the star, gave me a star to do, and since she gave me that starred pattern to do, I can do that. You know, so I have her permission. She also gave me a lot of other designs and patterns to do, so that I had done that. You know, so it's from teacher to student. Whatever um, she taught me, um, I taught to my students. So um, I took to it, and I, I think in 1980 I decided that I'm going to become a full-time quilt worker for the rest of my life. And uh, I did for a while until you know, I, uh, this archive, archivist job came up and that was an opportunity too because I would not even apply for a job with a tribe unless something that, like that came up. So when it came up, I applied and got the job. Worked there for 10 years and then retired and I'm back at quill work again. But also during those years, I also did quill work. On weekends and evenings, I would do the quill work. So um, I'm still doing quill work. So. Um, it's an art form I really enjoy. Um, so the other thing I'm going to pass around is when the Europeans came, they found Native people with uh, quills, quill jewelry. So this, this is a hair tie, and uh, it's a commercial dye, but um, and they use them for people to see, you know, what we can do, you know, with the quills. So that's kind of like the, a form of an older um, barrette. And then this other barrette going around, it's a strawberry with a circle behind it, like uh, the strawberry moon. Um, that's why I made it. I made it for one of my, my children. Her name was Odaman Jesus Queen, which means strawberry moon woman. So um, that's why I made this. So this Got a metal clasp in the back, but the rawhide on the back is, you know, it's birch bark and rawhide and quills. And I, I think that barrette's close to 20 some years old. So the first barrette with the orange and white on it, that's rawhide in the back. So it's an all natural product other than the imit imitation sinew that we use to sew it. So, um, And then I'll be passing around this bracelet. It's also another all natural piece. It's rawhide quills and leather and a thread and, uh, and a commercial dye. Some of these things that are going around are what I call my funerary objects. When I, <laughs> when I kick the bucket, I might go in those clothes or wear that hairband or, right. or something. So, and this one here is a little tobacco pouch. And when you smell it, it is smoked tan tobacco. Um, it's tanned the old way. And this is actually the only way you can put quills on smoked tan hide is when it's been smoked tan because if you try to put it on commercial leather, it doesn't work because the commercial leather is wimpy, stretches and shape, changes shape and does all kinds of things. But these keep it shaped, it can get wet, and it'll dry fast. But if you get a commercially tanned hide wet, then it shows the spots, and then it gets all bent out of shape. So uh, there's nothing like the smoke tan. That's the smell, it's the smoke that from when it was tanned. So with that, uh, if anybody's got some questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Have you made the earrings? I have. I have. Yeah. Yes, way back. You said the quills were on the back and the sides again. Are they on, on, on the belly as well? 
We have very stiff hairs on the belly. Stiff hairs. Okay. Yeah, very, very stiff. The, uh, when, if, when you have a porky for a pet, they try to be very careful with you. Mm -hmm. uh, they try not to hurt you. You go online, there's a, there's a thing called Porcupine Thinks He's a Dog. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a porky, so happy to see its owners that it actually runs around just like a puppy. Uh -huh. and, 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 and he hides in the corner and then he runs back to his person and then he runs back again. You know, he's circling around, you know, but he, they really have personalities. Uh, they're, they're amazing little creatures. Yes? I was curious, um, especially the oval box. How you're doing the birch bark? Do you steam it to get it into that nice shape? Or? No, it's very, very pliable. We can pass it around. It's very pliable, and the warmth of our hands helps it to bend and take shape. Okay, so and then the quills are holding it in that shape. Yes. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Tell us about gathering the bark. Um. When we, we, we get the bark, my teacher told me that <clears throat> Mort Neff, who did the wildlife program, went to her and wanted to know if she could show him how they picked bark. So they took their cameras out, you know, to take a picture while she was picking bark. So she, you shows her walking into the woods and she's looking at this nice birch tree. And the tree is about this big around and it's straight up. and. Uh, she shows her walking up to that tree and she's talking and motioning with her hands and, and she's pointing at the tree and then she's gonna step back and then it kind of cuts, you know, um, because when she stepped back and, and, and rea re really, she tripped on a stick and fell backwards. Uh -huh. <laughs> she was laughing, telling me about it. She said, I fell backwards on my back. She said, my feet and shoes went up. She said, my skirt went up. She uh -huh. said, all you could see was my shoes. And she goes, he, he, he. She said, that was so funny. She said, you know, so they, they cut, you know, she said, they edited that out. She said, and then when I got up, when finally I could stop laughing, she said, then I cut the bark and showed them how to do the bark thing. You know? But when we do go into the, to pick the bark, we pick trees that are at least eight to 12 inch in diameter. Nice straight trees is what we want because if you cook, pick bark from a crooked tree, you get a crooked quill box. So we try to pick from nice straight trees. We get permission from property owners. We have tribal um, gathering permits that is issued every year, a license to collect and gather. Um, Michigan State on their properties over at the biology station of Helston also have us go out there and show their students how it's picked because the biology people over there have been battling the bronze borer beetle since the 70s, yes. you know, which has killed all our native trees. So they have been working you know, closely with the tribe, and then our tribal natural resources also um, uh, help us get the bark. But when we do go out and pick bark, we pick a nice straight tree, uh, we put the tobacco down, say thank you for the opportunity to get this birch bark so that I continue making a living, making nice things out of the birch bark. And thank you for the tree, you know, for giving its outer skin. Because we know that when we pick it, it's not hurting the tree. And we, Susie used to say, you pick the, the bark when the uh, squirrel's ear is as big as your little finger. <laughs> I looked at her and I thought, well, we all got different shaped little fingers, you know. <laughs> uh, so I kind of gave her a sideways look and started to grin and she said, no, how about this? You pick the birch bark when the wild strawberries in the area where you live is ripe. So that was closer, yeah. So, during those times, and it's June, and we have different people go out and check trees. And, and the bark strips, they call up right away and they'll say, you know, I'm bark <coughs> stripping, and then hang up. And that's when we make arrangements to go out and pick bark. And so when we get to a big tree then, we reach up and we cut a little teeth cut. You don't have to cut deep, probably a 30 second of an inch into the tree. A little teeth cut, and then lift up the corner, and if the corner lifts up, and lifts up real easy, That's then that perfect. bark is ready to pick. So we finish cutting all the way down the tree, and then probably almost ground level, we pick it and, it and it comes off because it has a grain around the tree. And all you can hear, if you've never heard it before, it's like a gunshot in the woods when the tree pops off, when the bark pops off the tree. It's just like a rifle sound. It goes like 
<laughs> and you turn and look and say, somebody's picking Mark over there. <laughs> and we don't think somebody's shooting at us, you know, but that's exactly what it sounds like. So when we go in a group then, and we know that there's people in the woods, oh, so-and-so's got one, you know. So I take my son, he's like 6'4", so when he reaches up, he gets great big long cheeks. And then uh, we tease my sister, because she's like 5'11", and when she picks, my son comes along behind her and picks a bubber, you know, because you miss some pieces, you know, and you pick it. So we pick it, and we store it in a cool place, and then until we're ready to use it. So we only pick what we need for the year. There's 52 weeks in a year, and they make one quill box a week, usually. And then, uh, so that's only 50 sheets of bark. So I don't try to overtake and take what I need. You know, and if I do have extra, then I'll trade it with somebody else for what I have. You know, that's something that they might need that we can trade for. So we try not to buy and sell our materials. So, can you pick the same tree more than once? Or? Only after 10, 12 years after it has okay, it takes regrown. That long to once you pick it, recover. yeah. Once you pick it in season, once you take the bark off the tree, it's got, it's all wet. It's got sap on it, and we tell our pickers. Don't touch a tree after you remove the bark because that sap protects the tree. And, uh, and then 10, 12 years later, that tree replaces all the bark we picked, plus the years in between that it took, you know, it replaces itself. But a lot of people don't know how to pick and they go out and they cut too deep, they gouge out the tree, cut into the cambrian layer of the bark and then hurt the tree. So. Uh, that's why I take special care to to teach people how to do it right and to just take what they need. Any other questions? Well, since Yvonne's being very modest, she's not bringing some of you know the stuff she. I don't think she has like boxes on hand because you sell them all the time. They're sold before we make them. So uh, I decided to call Miss Emily in the back. And you might remember this piece of wood. So this is like a finished product of just. I want to give you an example of the caliber of, of her work. And um, can I take it home with me? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, little owl. Oh, Eric. Oh, uh, up, 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 up. You have a chance to. Go yeah, you can come up and see them. Yeah. You got to look in detail. But uh. To maybe bring a little memory lane here. And, uh, <laughs> wow. Do you have a signature on your, your boxes so someone would know they're your boxes? Um, mine are different. Um, I think it's the in depth detail on the animals. A guy told me one time that the only thing missing were the fleas. <laughs> but on the boxes I do since 1980, I put my initials on the side. On there. So this one's Y M K. So that meant that was made after 1985. And then it's all it's regular quill box, but it's buckskin lined in the inside. And then I carved out the uh, the handle out of ash. So um, white ash, which is a very functional tool that we use. Black ash is used for making the baskets, but the white ash is used for handles. It's a utilitarian, it's a harder wood. So it's, uh, yeah. So that's bear doing bear things. <laughs> and I always liked doing this owl. They say owls look smart. And, and I kind of think I kind of, kind of captured that in the tie, you know, when I, when I made it, so. Um, a lot of times, I don't know what happens to the boxes that I make. I just like to make them, and they go to market, and, and sometimes I never see them again. One thing that freaked me out was taught my husband how to make that. He watched me for years, and he said, well, maybe I should try that. I said, yeah, try it. I said, you never know. So he started making a quill box, and I taught him, and then uh, his first quill box, I said, he made a, an eagle. His first quill box. And usually when people make their first quill box, we have to make the star because you need to learn to lay the quill side by side. Well, he made an eagle head 
this size. And then uh, I told him it was going to be too rough to, you know, for you to do. He says, I think I can do it. So he did it. He took it down to the store on Lake Street called Made in Michigan, and he sold it to them. And then a week later, Made in Michigan sold it to Petoskey City Sister in Japan. So just like that, he became an international. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit mad. <laughs> Because I've been making pool boxes all these years, you know, and I didn't know where the boxes went, you know, so, but just like that, his first pool box, you know, and, uh, and, and it turned out really good, so he continued on, and, and uh, uh, Michigan State has bought a lot of his pool boxes. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Um, yes. On the uh, harvesting of the quills, you said that um, you didn't want a pelt from the summer. How is a, a porcupine's pelt different summer and winter? In the summertime, his diet is lush. He eats watermelon rinds, potato chips, you know. He'll <laughs> clean up the food in somebody's mulch pile, you know. So it's all veggies, you know, and things, you know, that, that's the juicy stuff. That's and, what he likes. And that makes the quills different? It makes his, like, just like us, if we eat too much rich food, we start to bulge out and get gray. And, uh, the same thing with the porky. And even our hair quality changes. You know, people get blisters on their scalp, you know, because of their diet. So, um, so it's his diet has a lot to do with, uh, with the quality of the quills. So we don't touch the summer ones because they're not completely formed either. You know, if you pull a bunch out, you know, and the, the hair follicle is not developed because they're growing new ones for the following winter. So since they're constantly growing and shedding, um, summertime and their lush diet is what makes their quills grow. So we let, leave them alone at that time. Yeah. Well, I just happen to think we've got uh, Canadian quills. Is there it looks like their quills are thicker. Much bigger, yes. Is that the particular kind of porcupine? Or? It may be. Um, or I have the seen season? Some, well, I have seen quill boxes uh, back in like uh, 1824, I think, was when a bunch of Native Americans from Emmett County packed up in the night and they left. They fled the county because they were they were afraid of the removal of being shipped out west and being put on reservations. So they ran away in the night and went to Canada to Manitoulin Island. When they arrived there, Canadian government says, we'll give you a refuge here, you can stay here, you just gotta obey our rules and our laws. So they complied. Well, when they left, they also took all their art forms with them, including the language. So they continued doing pull work in Canada but it was faster and quicker to use the bigger quills. Mm -hmm. And so they developed their own style of doing quill work. And uh, there is a big difference between Canadian quill work and American quill work because ours are the finer quills, more detailed quills. And I was really surprised when I had Victor say one time, you know, that uh, he says, Emmett County produces the finest quill work in the world. Wow. And I thought, Wow, you know, that's, that's something, you know? Yeah. You know and, and it's the first time I heard it, you know, it, you know, I was surprised, you know, but, but he was really praising the quill workers, and he was, he was a buyer of quill boxes, so he demanded very, very good work. He would, when we took that quill box into him, he would take it, set it under the table, look at it, and set it down and walk away. And I thought, what the heck, doesn't he like it? You know? <laughs> and I'd stand there looking at him, and then he'd come back and he'd pick it up and he'd look at it again. It wasn't until after he was gone that he had walked on that he could not believe what he was seeing. Yeah. That's why he set it down and walked away. You know, but he never told me I was doing a good job. Wow. You know, he would have got a little eyepiece and look at it real close, and he was looking for flaws. Ah. You know, and if he found him, he would give it back and say, look, that quill's gonna break right there, you know. And he would give it back, and we would repair it, and then he would take it back again. But those kind of scrutinizing made us do a better job. You know, we didn't like what he was doing, but it, his demands made it better. 
So uh, in the end, you know, his his demands, you know, became fulfilled, and you know, and the statement that he made is, is true. The finest poet in the world comes out of Emmett County, which, which is really nice. Yeah. Yes. Is someone going to be the teacher after you? I am teaching my, I have five children. Four of them do quill work. I have 15 grandkids. Two of them are doing quill work. Right. So uh, the young people are learning how to do presentations and learning how to teach. So, um, and they were never as shy as I was. <laughs> <laughs> so now they tell me to cash up meals. <laughs> Can you say coffee pine in Odawa? Gok. Gok? Yeah. Yeah. No, you call them Gok or Gog, either either one, G-O-G. So it's uh, very simple. Is it the same word whether it's alive or dead? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? So thank you for letting me talk. Oh,